sun as the days go on forever There's no place for time when you're young Can't find the words but we know how we feel Could we stay longer here in the summer?
still It's like you're stuck in a nightmare But you keep doing it for the thrill Well, this is reality You only live it once So wake up from your dream But just for tonight Let the lines get blurred Let your thoughts be free Let your thoughts be free Okay, it's Mark, and it's time to start our live show. And um, so, let's see. Okay, I think everything is ready. I think the camera is set to uh, autofocus. I um, I increased the resolution of our camera since last week, so hopefully, uh, hopefully everything will be a little bit clearer this time. Um, let's see. There we go. So, uh, sorry, Janet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They have a whole bunch of different kind of music on uh, on Monster Cat, so maybe I'll try to find something different. All right. So, uh, last week what we did was we uh, we cast all these faces of our king character, and after we did that, we reshaped the mouths a bit. And so, let's see if the autofocus works here. There we go. That actually works pretty good, I think, compared to what I had last time. So uh, I don't think I need a new webcam. I think that this one's working pretty good. Um, the only thing is, is when you increase the resolution, everything's kind of like, ooh, look at that. It looks like my fingers are bending there. <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, there's some kind of like a, a delay and there's a lot of motion blur, but at least it looks pretty good. Uh, so anyhow, so what are we going to do this week? Um, well, I've got some uh, I've got some black paint, and this stuff uh, is pretty old, but it's still good. And uh, so black is a pretty much, you know, one of the more common color colors you'll probably buy um, if you collect some acrylic paints. And uh, so I got a, a large one, uh, but you can get these actually in pretty much any kind of craft store. They usually come in smaller bottles, but I use a lot of it, so. Uh, this is what we're going to use. And um, if you guys have checked the news recently, uh, you might have noticed that there's something called Vanta Black, which is a really super dark black acrylic paint. And you can buy it uh, in the UK. I believe it's actually, uh, it's not called Vanta Black. It's called something else, the stuff you can buy. But um, that would be perfect for these mouths. But we're just going to use that later on and paint inside there. Uh, but I've got one more mouth I'm going to work on here first. And I didn't cast any extra faces. 
Um, I should have probably cast some today, but I didn't have time, unfortunately. Um, so we're just going to work with what we have. And I'm going to try to figure out uh, what would be a good, another good mouth to make for the king. And so we have kind of like the ah, the ooh. We don't really have a lot of, a lot of other shapes which are going to be important. Um, so really, these are just like, uh, you know, this could be an M perhaps, but I think it's more like a neutral. I think for an M, I'm going to, uh, I think I'll do that next. And so this one, this character, I think what I'm going to do, or this face, is I'm going to make the, the lips a little bit like in a higher position. So the M is going to be more accented. But first, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Hey, Ron, welcome to the show. And uh, let me see. So uh, let's see if I can zoom a little bit more. Hmm, well, this is probably pretty good. Okay. And hit OK. And let's see. Is it in focus? Well, it's probably the best it's going to look for now, I think. And let me move this down a little bit. Yeah, the focus definitely makes it look pixelated, I guess you could say. And Janet says, scientists now discovered a new blue. Yep, I heard about that. Let's see here. I need some more orange. Hmm. You know, I probably should not have used. I probably should not have used. Well, what I could probably do. Let's see. Is this the same clay? Oh, it is. Okay. So I've got some extra orange clay. I think I did. All right, so what am I going to do here? I'm going to <laughs> Yep, that's what it is. Exactly what it is. I've got some black paint on my hand already there. But uh, let's see the M I think is going to have to be Uh, I can probably just push this clay up, see what happens. Yeah, I'm gonna, gonna add a little bit of clay to his lips. Rayella even does a contest for the name of this blue. Cool. Yeah, I think Crayola comes up with a lot of new colors and they ask people to name them. And <clears throat> it's amazing how long that crayon company has been around, you know? I think Crayola's been around for. I mean, it's been around since I've been a kid. It's like the standard crayon of the world, you know. <laughs> it's like they have a, a monopoly. And then the other companies out there that make crayons, what they seem to do is they mass produce crayons and give them to restaurants for little kids. Free crayons for kids. It's kind of interesting. If you eat in a restaurant, that's always... Uh, always the way it is it's like how do we keep kids amused we put a kids menu on a piece of paper and put some crossword puzzles and connect the dots and give them a little package of crayons but it's never Crayola Crayola crayons which is kind of strange you know Well, not really strange, but 
you would think that Criolla would try to uh, work with restaurants and get some crayon sales that way. So let's see here. So here's our neutral, and then this one would be a little bit further up. Yeah, I think his chin could go up just a tad bit as well. So it's like his whole lower face is kind of moving upwards. It's kind of nice that it's actually coming in kind of clear on the web camera. It looks better than what I what, what my DSLR was was doing the last time. Except the uh, the frame rate here is just kind of it's kind of slow. Ron Call says the new blue should be named Krennic. <laughs> A Star Wars color. And then uh, he says, why do they only give the crayons to children? It's not fair. Yeah, crayons are actually pretty good, you know. What makes crayons so awesome? I mean, it's like, it's the cheapest way to color something, and it works pretty good, and... But nobody takes it serious. <laughs> Like I've never, I've never seen like a fine artist make some kind of a thing from Crayola crayons and have it, you know, become sort of like a popular, popular thing that sells for a million dollars. It's always oil paintings, sculptures, you know, out of like junk. But not crayons, not a crayon picture or portrait or landscape or anything like that. It's always something else. It's like our culture. It's like if you associate something with kids, it's just not cool. Which is probably why clay animation is not super popular. Hey, Dominica, Dominica, Dominica. Probably saying that wrong. So, welcome to the show. We're just uh, working on some replacement faces. I'm going to smooth this out a bit with, uh, of course, rubbing alcohol. I've been using which it's not really my my favorite thing to use actually you know what I think I've got some clean I think I had some mineral oil in here but I'm not sure how clean this is let me see I think I was using this to smooth out my um, other sculpture which is darker in color so there's some dark clay in here but I can flip this over Ooh, I see a lot of oil in this I probably put too much yeah, I can show you guys. Uh, just gonna clean off my brush just a bit, and so here's what mineral oil does to the sculpture. It actually smooths it better than anything, honestly speaking. The only problem is that it leaves that like you know slight shine to it but after it's smooth you can rub it a little bit and it gets rid of that so it looks nice yeah mineral oil is just the greatest at least with this kind of clay with uh well this is avalon but it works exactly the same with van aken clay and i think avalon is probably pretty close in terms of the formula between Van Aken and you know, the old, well, I think the newer formula for Van Aken was changed. A lot of people are complaining about it. 
I haven't bought any in a long time because I have a, a stockpile, but I've heard it's not so good. All right, so there we go. Somewhat of a, a slight change from this shape. So this is more neutral. This will be like the mmm shape. And, you know, it's going to be difficult for me to line up these teeth, I think. And kind of clean up this mouth a little. It's always helpful to turn your sculpture in different directions in order to see kind of like where you have, um, like here, for example, I had a lot of lines, tool marks, and from this direction, I couldn't really see it. So I turn it in this direction and I can kind of see down in his mouth. It's not really imperative to clean it up so much like that because these will be laying flat. So of course, you know, everything has to look good at this angle, but still, might as well do it anyway. Just make it look as good as you can. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, and Janet says, when I was a kid, I always used watercolored, watercolor colored pencils. That's neat. Yeah, you, know, you should uh, definitely create some more artwork. I don't think I've seen much of your artwork, Janet. So how did your, I know you made like a, a pet petition for, um, what was it, for princesses to be shown on Disney films or something? Slavic princesses or and you got a lot of signatures <laughs> which is pretty neat I guess but how many uh, signatures did you get I'll just kind of clean up this mouth as well just a slight bit and maybe this cheek as well See how all this looks before doing the next step. Yeah, it's hard to resist not like like if I go to a craft store or someplace, it's hard to resist not wanting to buy stuff, particularly. Uh, over a bit so you guys can see everything I'm trying to center stuff on the camera a bit nicely here and there we go and Ron says I used watercolor pencils too but mine were Schwann Stabilo but I never used them as watercolor I only drew with them oh yeah, because you can just, uh, you can like take it and put it on a canvas, right? And add some water for painting purposes. I never really understood how that worked. All I know is that every time I go to the craft store, those pencils are expensive. Okay, so now going to get in here and paint up these mouths a bit. Should I do the eyes first or the mouths? Maybe the eyes. See now I could I could take uh let's do make sure I get this really accurate. Um, I could take black clay and try to put black clay in all these eyes, but I want to make it so that it's accurate and I can probably do a better job with this paintbrush than with the clay. So I'm trying to 
hopefully get this to look nice. I won't know until I actually animate these how this will work. If it'll animate, you know, the way I'm thinking it will. Um, Oh, that's nice, Ron. So you can you can buy all your stuff. I wish I had a local store like that. We don't. I mean, New York is a good good place to get stuff that's you know, silicones and things like that. I remember there was a place called I think it was called Pearl Paints or something something to that effect in New York and it was like a smorgasbord of any kind of art material, art material, and you know, sculpting material and painting material you could ever want. Some of the things that we did um, at Gentleman Films when we used to do this, like the Cartoon Network special, uh, or not special, um, just the cartoons we worked on, we would take uh, animation, cartoon animation cell paints and do something like this with our our sculptures. And that paint was the greatest paint ever. I'm not really sure what the difference was between that and acrylics, but it had a kind of like a, a smooth way of just flowing over your stuff, whatever you painted it on. And it had like a rubberiness to it as well. Oh, pearl paint closed down? That's too bad. See, in New York, you would think that would survive because so many people are artists there. Maybe, digitally speaking, people are going more digital these days. You know, there's so many free applications out there for painting and stuff, and there's tablets. Maybe people are just doing that, which is which would be a shame. Oh. All right. Well. not super good this way this uh, my paintbrush has a little stray hair coming off the side of it it's not the greatest paintbrush I'm trying to make it into a point because it's hard to be, do it accurately Kind of screwed up a little bit. Now I don't know if it's going to really make matter so much, like well, if it if it'll um bleh, make a difference in how the animation looks, but I know it needs to be kind of accurate. <laughs> Yep, I was born in New York. I grew up in a place called Bayshore on Long Island.
and my my address was 36 21st Avenue in Bayshore New York 11706 and it was pretty nice I mean things have really changed you know since I was a kid just the whole the whole way that people interact now is so different you know, we used to have a lot of parties and people over our house all the time and a lot of outdoor type activities you know, I had a lot of friends and everybody was always outside and then I moved to Missouri when I was like 15 or so and it was a big difference super big difference and nowadays uh, if you are friendly with your neighbors or walk down the street and say hello to people or anything like that pretty much everybody looks at you funny <laughs> you know it's it's really sad it's like um, people are just really I mean at least in my neighborhood um, I don't know. It's kind of a mixture of, of uh, I don't know how to explain it really, but nobody knows each other here. Most neighbors don't talk to each other too much. And if you try to be, uh, you know, approachable, they kind of look at you really funny or and we've got some uh, some neighbors that are not so nice. They're like, you know, literally they're they kind of belong on like a Jerry Springer show where there's a lot of drama. And um, some kids used to knock our trash over and you know flip us off and all kinds of stuff. You know, it's like talking like you know. 10 year old and 15 year old like I don't know it's like you don't want to leave your house you know everybody's so uptight out there crazy people but the good part is just means more time for creativity <laughs> people don't want to talk to you then create stuff I think it's kind of that way everywhere though you know from what there's this one comedian where uh, he's like you know if you're gonna go over somebody's house back in the day you can just go to their house and knock on their door and they'll let you in and they'll be happy to see you and nowadays they'll be mad at you and ask you you know to uh to text them or call them first or whatever you know if you show up it's like an you know an annoyance to people which uh which is kind of sad <laughs> but uh people are not they're they're easily in it's entertained by netflix and things like that and people don't have to rely on each other for that kind of entertainment anymore. It's like video games, Facebook, YouTube, Netflix. So, but in a way, it's good for, for animation because you can, you know, more people are likely to watch YouTube and find your stuff. So the social changes out there are actually good for animation. And if you notice, a lot more people do stop motion and are into it because, you know, there's like a reward that people like your videos or leave comments. And normally, you know, most people, like when I was growing up, if you wanted to get your stuff out there, you would try to get it on television somehow or you would make VHS tapes of it and try to send it around to places and maybe film festivals but now with YouTube 
it's like you could have thousands of people see your stuff and really it's not hard to do it's like upload the video put a title on it maybe some tags and that's pretty much it right Oh. Oh, really, Ron? <laughs> That's cool. Yep, so you're not far from where I grew up. So there was a chance that we could have met each other at some point. Maybe you saw me like in a grocery store. They still have uh, Pathmark uh, shopping centers there. <laughs> and Woolworth and all that kind of stuff. I think Woolworth probably closed down, but... And uh, Ron says, nobody knows each other anywhere. All our socializing is done through the safety of online. The internet ruined human contact because it's easier to be friends with people online, people who don't really know you. Yeah. And Ron says, the internet saves stop motion. Yeah, definitely. And then it says, in my small city, everybody knows each other and makes rumors. Even when you go to shop, they don't say name of shop, but last name owner. I hate this. <laughs> what are you saying now? So there's like, it's like a small town and they're gossipy, huh? Yeah, if you're in a small place, people generally know each other really well. Yeah, like my son is, you know, he's going to be nine years old here pretty soon in November. <clears throat> and I feel bad because he doesn't have a lot of friends. Like he's got friends and um, like he's got like a one neighbor friend or actually a, a few friends, but they're all in this one house behind us. And uh, that's pretty good, I think. This black paint works pretty nice. Um, but it's not the same as like when I was a kid, you know, I used to go out and we had a bicycle, I had a bicycle and we'd go out there and so we had like a, a bike gang, you know, we were little kids and it was like, you know, we'd all get on our bikes and drive, drive around and we had skateboards and things like that. And it was fun. And we're always with our friends, going to their house, making crazy videos. You know, we had a video camera, one of the first to ever be made. So our neighbors and I would, would make these crazy movies, like a horror film and stuff. And uh, it was kind of neat. I was a filmmaker since I was a little kid, as soon as I could get a camera. So Ron says, nope, I never met you here, I'm sure. I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. I moved to New York City after that and then lived in Flushing for over a decade. My mom lived in Flushing um, and for over a decade. And we moved here to Long Island 10 years ago. Cool. Welcome to the show, Dude Man 7. And uh, yeah, so anyway, let's see. What can we do next? Um, I probably got to add some teeth to these faces next here. So what color clay did I use? I think I used this, which is a slightly, it's not pure white. It's not like the pure white clay, which I have over here. It's a little bit darker. I think all I did was add a little bit of black to it. Put this somewhere else. So I need to find my tool. Where is my tool? Here it is. All right, so it's my uh, wax spatula 
the below seven wax spatula tool, which is a pretty popular tool for sculpting. So it's just made from stainless steel, and you guys have seen me use this a lot. I really like it, it's a great tool. These teeth are small. Just gonna kind of put them in place, and then I'll take my tool and work it, work it in there properly. Really need to cut my nails too. Sculpting with uh, nails, even slightly long like that, is not nice. I don't recommend it. Now. As I put these teeth in here, I'm going to uh, have to make sure that they line up with this neutral face. And what I can do is I can look at some points on his head and see where this tooth, um, you know, is in what 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 it is in line with. And actually, it's in line with uh, the outside edge of this eye and the the bottom point of this brow straight up and down so I'm gonna kind of do that with these and make sure that these teeth are in the same positions so oops might be kind of nice to have this tooth sticking out slightly like there's some dimension instead of putting the tooth all the way far back in the mouth I think having it slightly forward on this lip would be nicer and so this one I have to move over so it's straight up and down with this part of the face about here I have to see how it looks and then if it does it doesn't look right I'll move it this one goes here so I think this I should probably like put it right on the edge where the black is. There we go. I think that looks pretty good. Like that. Oh. Sometimes it'll stick to your tool like that, which is annoying. So let's put it back. So his teeth are rounded, so I, I want to make sure that they're not going to drastically change shape between placement mouths. So round it a bit. Yeah, I think that's probably about as good as I can get that one. All right. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so I gotta move this one tooth in a bit. Just a bit in this direction. It to work. Hmm. Stick, stick tooth, stick in there. It's not popping out. Hmm. All right, well, there's a solution. Um, so if your clay isn't sticking to itself, you can add a little bit of mineral, mineral oil to this. Fortunately, this brush is too wide. All right. But um, the theory behind this is that if you want clay to stick to itself, and it's not, 
mineral oil will melt the clay a little bit because it's a chemical that literally uh, gets absorbed into the clay and softens it up a bit. So it worked. Um, I put a little bit on the surface of the face and it's sticking to that and not my tool. So I can get in here and, and detail this a bit if I need to, like this, and not worry about it popping off all the time. Oops. One of those silly tricks you learn from experience. And that's a lot easier to work with. <laughs> okay. Let's see, and the original mouth. Okay, so this tooth has to go outward slightly. Ah, oh, okay, uh, Voltaire, yeah. He's done some awesome stuff out there. I haven't really heard much about him. I know he was teaching for a while. And that's cool. So I guess he's still teaching, perhaps. Oops. You know, I think this mouth here, I might not even add teeth to this one. I think if uh, he's making an M, the mm, having those teeth disappear might be a good thing. Maybe just slightly adding a little bit of a tooth there. Where they would be. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, a lot of stop motion people will turn to teaching because it's profitable when there's no work. So you'll find a lot of stop motion artists that are in schools and stuff. Because you know, they don't like that freelance, you know, the idea of doing freelance work. I think I need to like accent this little this chin a little bit here to give the illusion that his chin kind of sticks out a little bit. So even though this is just a relief sculpture, you, you got to kind of think all this stuff through in terms of how stuff, you know, will move, what it will look like if it does move. So it's going to add just a little bit of meat to his chin. So what do you guys think about the direction of stop, stop motion has taken with the advancements in 3D printers and all? Well, it's an exciting time for sure. 3D printing and sculpting gives you a lot of options. And I've recently thought about how I could um, use a 3D printer to make you know to sculpt my characters and then make replacement faces which 
uh, I could take and and break things up uh, in 3D and then make molds of that and then cast everything in clay. So you could, uh, in theory, you know, the way that they used to do it in, at Will Vinton's was to do that with clay and then make molds of the clay. But 3D printing, you can do it when there's more accuracy to it. You know, if you get like a nice uh, laser-based like SLA printer, so there's kind of more accuracy to it. And also you could quickly make uh, changes to the mouths and things without sculpting it in clay. And then when you make a mold, you just pour that stuff in there. You know, you're, you're melted clay in the mold and and have at it, pretty much. So it's just a different way to do things. But I think in the end, uh, the story is the most important part, no matter what technique you use. Let's see here. So, all right. So I'm going to add teeth to this guy here. Hmm, so let's do this. And Ron says, Voltaire did get me my first professional job though at a studio called Broadcast Arts where they made Pee Wee's Playhouse. And Ron says, I'm not a fan of 3D printing stuff. I feel it detracts from the handmade aspect, but I do embrace technology, but I'm more into the Harryhausen Tippett style special effects. That's cool. There's some great uh, videos from Tested on YouTube. The channel is called Tested uh, with Phil Tippett and the... Uh, Go to his studio and he explains his techniques and things and shows off his work. And it's so inspiring. But he's more of like a naturalist. He really likes to, to go for that. Um, let's see here, line this up again. You know, if you look at what his influences are, it's more natural. Uh, sort of um, museum type taxidermy models and uh, you know bones and organic stuff he's a very organic person I guess you could say in terms of his influences whereas you know for me I'm more of a cartoony person I kind of like stuff like this because it's it's not, uh, I mean, we kind of see organic stuff all the time, so. This kind of transcends that, I guess you could say. Cartoon characters can do stuff which is unnatural, <laughs> as opposed to natural. Keep bumping this camera with my head here. So, uh, you know, you can't make like a realistic dinosaur has squash and stretch. It wouldn't look right. But something like this you could, you know, you can do some crazy stuff. Let's see, I think it's going to have to move this tooth forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. For this one, I think I need to have a little bit of a hint of a tongue inside there as well. Oh, there's my tool. And I think 
think a darker color red is good for that. So I'm going to go with this dark red that I have. Ken is asking, has anybody thought about using a three doodler pen for anything in stop motion? Well, I have a, a real 3D printer, so I don't need one of those, but you know, why not? If you can find a purpose for it. You can definitely make a puppet out of one or using one. Stay in there, Tom. Okay. This, I think, is pretty good. So we got six completed faces. And what time is it? We got about 10 minutes left, so. Let's see, I guess what I could do is I can sort of clean these other faces up, which are our second mother character. So I'm going to move these out of here. In fact, um, I think I'm going to put our faces on the cardboard that we, the shelving system we made the other day, or the other week, and put these away. Voila. Here, that way, no dust gets on them. Put our other faces in. So, what got you guys into stop motion? It's a good question. Well, I always liked industrial light and magic and Phil Tippett's work. I always wanted to work for ILM, and so I really liked everything they did. I loved their the characters they made for the Star Wars films, and you know different ship models and things, and uh, UFOs for ET. You know all plastic model kits, and you know Dennis Muren was like you know those guys were heroes to me, and. Pretty much liked everything that they did and I loved the behind the scenes stuff they did and I always wanted to emulate that but uh, the other thing that I liked was the stuff that Will Vinton did from Will Vinton you know the the California Raisins and the Domino's Pizza Noid all that stuff in the 1980s was really cool so uh, when I was a little kid my parents used to buy me clay a lot, so I would sculpt things, and I got pretty good at it. And I was able to make similar sculptures to what they did at Will Vinton's. Maybe not as perfectly well, but pretty good. From when I was about maybe uh, 16 or 17 years old. And, you know, I followed their work for a few years and collected all kinds of magazines and stuff and anything about the studio that I could find, which was really rare because there was not really a lot of information about stop motion out there. And so I met a guy named Mike McKinney from Wolverton Studios. He did a, a countrywide tour and he bought some puppets and things on his tour and went to different museums and um, the museums I guess would pay him a little bit to do do some classes on uh, clay animation and I brought along some of my sculpture you know pictures of my sculptures to, with you know with me and uh, it was my sister's boyfriend at the time who drove me up to the pla this place called the magic house in St. Louis, Missouri. And so I went out there and I brought some pictures along and he was impressed and uh, said, oh, you know, this is amazing. And, you know, why don't you come aside, you know, to the side in 
wait until I'm done with my class and then I'll tell you all about it you know how we make the puppets and how we animate and make the armatures and things and for me it was kind of like whoa you know I couldn't believe that somebody was going to teach me how all that was done and you know back then we had <clears throat> had just you know regular landline phones and not much in terms of the internet so we kept in touch over the phone and I, I went out to Portland and met him and um, he took me to Wolverton Studios and gave me a tour and introduced me to uh, John Ashley I met Chuck Duke I met Webster Colcord and other people that worked at the studio I met Kyle Bell. Kyle Bell kind of looked like me a little bit. <laughs> so it was kind of weird to see somebody else that looks like you and likes the same stuff, I guess. But um, man, these cheats are going to be hard to line up with all these mouths or replacement faces. Um, but long story short, um, I just kind of, you know, I, I learned how to do this and became good at it. And that's why, kind of why I stuck with it. But I really like all forms of stop motion. Pretty much everything. I think foam latex puppets are great. Stop, you know, wooden puppets, silicone puppets, plastic puppets, clay puppets. I love pretty much all kind of characters and techniques. And Ron says, uh, he was a super big fan of Saturday morning show Land of the Lost. Janet says, I love all genres of animation, but my favorite is hand-drawn and stop-motion because they have soul. And uh, so, dude, man, you're saying The Illusion of Life from Richard Williams and Animation Animator Survival Kit is what got you interested in it? That's a great book, or two great books, by the way. I've got both of those. They used to call that the, the animator's Bible. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, or whatever it is. Yeah, that was one of the first books about animation that was out there that explained everything in detail. All right, well, these faces I've kind of cleaned up a bit. Um, I'm kind of wondering how I'm going to do these mouths. I might just use like different stick on mouths, perhaps, you know? I'm not sure if I need to use a different head for the different mouth shape here. I could probably make different mouths to make her talk, but I could probably use these to uh, have her look to the left. So maybe this one would be like the left. What would be a good left one? This would actually be a good left one because this one kind of has a, a flat edge on this side. So I'm going to put an L on her forehead. Like for loser, maybe. <laughs> That's usually what most people think. All right. And uh, so this one, I'll put an R. So I'll make this one look to the right. So next week, what I'll do is I'm going to work on those. And then I think I could probably do for perhaps like a squash and stretch with these two. S and S, squash and stretch. Um, so the left hand side one, uh, I would make the replacement mouths for the left and replacement mouths for the right. So I don't think I need replacement heads so much for, for her talking. And she's not going to have a lot of talking as well. I think she's going to be mostly um, pantomime, you know, just basic animation with her body to get the points across in the film. So I'm not too worried about that. But I think squash and stretch would be nice to have. So maybe just like a flatter one, one in between. I should probably do another one to make it really exaggerated. But... Uh, all right, so that's going to be our plan for next week. I guess uh, since we've only got a few more minutes left and I don't want to get into that now, uh, it's probably a good time to end the show. So uh, anyways, I do appreciate you guys stopping by and chatting for an hour or so. And I will see you all next week. See you all later.